Nancy Houston. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our, uh, our conversation will start with the reading by Nancy. And after, after, after the reading, we will have a conversation which will also include the audience. So let me start by giving the floor to Nancy for your reading. I'm awake. like flicking on a switch and flooding a room with light. Snapping out of sleep, clicking into wakefulness, a perfectly functioning mind and body, six years old and a genius. First thought every morning when I wake up. My brain floods into the world. The world floods into my brain. I control and own every part of it. Palm Sunday, early. Gigi here visiting. Mom and Dad still asleep. A sunny Sunday, sun, 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 sun king. Sol, Solly, Solomon. I'm like sunlight, all powerful instantaneous and invisible, flowing effortlessly into the darkest corners of the universe. Capable at six of seeing, illuminating, understanding everything. In a flash, I'm washed and dressed, my hair is combed and my bed is made. Yesterday's socks and underwear are in the dirty laundry basket. Later in the week, they'll be washed, dried, ironed, and folded by my mother, then returned to my top drawer, ready to be used again. This is called a cycle. All cycles have to be controlled and supervised, such as the food cycle. Food circulates through your body and turns into you, who you are. So you have to be careful about what you let in and what you keep out. I am exceptional. I can't allow just anything into my body. My poop has to come out the right color and consistency. This is part of the circulation. I'm actually never hungry, and mom is very understanding about this. She only gives me foods I like because they circulate with ease. Yogurt and cheese and pasta, peanut butter and bread and cereal. She doesn't insist on the whole vegetable, meat, fish, eggs, aspect of eating, saying, I'll get around to that when I'm good and ready for it. She makes me mayonnaise sandwiches and cuts the crusts off for me, but even then I only eat half or a quarter of the sandwich and it's enough. I nibble at the bread and wet the small pieces with the saliva in my mouth and swish them up between my lips and gums to let them gradually dissolve because I don't want to actually swallow them. The point is to keep my mind sharp. Dad wishes I'd eat like a normal growing American boy. He uh, worries about how I'll manage at the cafeteria when I start school next fall. But mom says she'll pick me up and bring me home for lunch. That's what stay at home moms are for. God gave me this body and this mind and I have to take the best possible care of them so I can put them to the best possible use. I know he's got high intentions for me. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been born in the wealthiest state of the wealthiest country in the world with the most powerful weapon system capable of blasting the whole human species to kingdom come. Fortunately, God and President Bush are buddies. I think of heaven as one big Texas in the sky, with God rambling around in a cowboy hat and boots and checking to make sure everything is on, in order on his ranch, taking an occasional pot shot at a planet for the fun of it. When they 
dragged Saddam Hussein out of his rat hole the other day. His hair was all matted and dirty, his eyes bleary and bloodshot, his beard unkempt, and his cheeks gaunt. Dad sat there in front of the TV set and cheered. Boy, that's what I call defeat, he said. I hope all those Muslim terrorists know what's in store for them. Randall, said Mom, who was just then setting down a tray in front of him with an icy glass of beer and a bowl of peanuts. We should be careful about what we say. You wouldn't want to give Solly the impression that all Muslims are terrorists, would you? I mean, I'm sure there are Muslims living right here in California who are very nice people. I just don't happen to know them personally. She said this in a joking tone of voice, but I know she was also telling the truth. Dad took a long swig of beer and said, yeah, you're right, Tessie, I'm sorry, and burped loudly, which Mom decided to take as a joke, so she laughed. I got wonderful parents who love each other, which isn't the case of most kids in my kindergarten. You can tell they love each other because their framed wedding photos are still standing on the buffet, along with all the congratulations cards, <laughs> though they got married seven years ago. Mom is actually two years older than Dad, I hate to admit it. <laughs> and she certainly doesn't look it, but she's 30. Some of the kids in kindergarten have mums in their 40s. And my friend's Brian's mum is 50, which is older than my grandmother, Sadie. That means she had, ha she had him when she was 44 years old, which is disgusting. I can't believe people go on screwing in old age. Yes, I know how babies are made. I know everything. It's actually Grandma Sadie who chose my name for me. She always regretted not giving Dad a Jewish name. So when the next generation came along, she didn't want to miss her chance a second time. And Mom said it was okay with her. Mom's an easygoing person. She basically wants for everybody to be as happy as possible. And I guess Saul can be a Christian name too. That's about the extent of my grandmother's influence in my life. Because luckily, she lives far away in Israel, and I almost never see her. Except in the photos she sends us, which are always close-ups, so you can't see she's sitting in a wheelchair. I say luckily because if she lived any closer, she'd try to interfere with us and boss us around like Dad says she always does. Even though he's her own son, he dislikes her. But at the same time, he's scared of her, and he doesn't dare to stand up to her. So whenever she comes here for a visit, there's quite a lot of tension in the air, which upsets my mother. As soon as Grandma Sadie's back is turned, Dad gets courageous and attacks her. Once he said she was to blame for the death of his beloved father, Aaron, who was a failed playwright, at the age of 49. And Mom said, as far as she knew, Dad's father was killed by smoking cigarettes rather than by his wife. But Dad said there was a well-known connection between cancer and repressed anger, which I'm not sure what that means, repressed. My father once lived in Israel himself when he was my age, and he loved the city of Haifa so much that of all the places to live in the United States of America, that's why he chose California because the eucalyptus and palm trees and orange groves and flowering bushes reminded him of the good old days in Israel. And um, that's also where he started not liking Arabs because of some Arab girl he fell into and out of love with there, which I don't know anything about because whenever he talks about it, he gets all tense and clams up. And even to mom, it's a mystery what happened with this childhood sweetheart of his. Grandma Sadie is um, a cripple and an Orthodox Jew, unlike anyone else in the family. She wears a wig because when you're an Orthodox Jewish female, you're not supposed to show your hair to anyone except your husband in case they covet you and want to screw you out of wedlock. 
given that she's widowed and confined to a wheelchair, I'd be surprised if anyone would like to covet and screw her, but she still refuses to take off her wig. Recently, this rabbi in Florida ordered Jewish women to stop wearing wigs made out of Indian women's hair. Because in India, they bow down to gods with six arms or elephant heads or whatever, and their hair gets all sullied by praying to these gods. So Jewish women will also get sullied by wearing wigs made out of, <laughs> made out of it. So they should buy new synthetic wigs at once, the rabbi said. But grandma said that was going too far. The wheelchair is because of a car, car accident she was in many years ago. But it certainly doesn't keep her from getting around. <laughs> She's been to more countries than everyone else in the family put together. She's a famous lecturer and her own mother, Era, my gra great-grandmother, who I call Gigi, is a famous singer. And when daddy gets around to enlisting for Iraq, he'll be a famous war hero. And it's up to me to decide what I want to be famous about, but that'll be no problem at all. Fame runs in the family. <sighs> Unlike my father, whose mom was away hectoring in universities all the time when he was little, I have an excellent mom who decided to be a stay-at-home out of her own free will and not because it was women's destiny like in the olden days. Her name is Tess, but I call her mom. All children call their mother mom, of course, but sometimes in the park another kid calls mom and my mother spins around thinking it's me. I can't believe she could confuse me with anyone else. It's like when someone else's cell phone has the same ring as yours, she says. You sort of snap to attention and then realize, oh no, it's, <laughs> it's not me they want. It's not like a cell phone. I am unique. My voice is my voice. At kindergarten and elsewhere, I amaze everybody with my reading skills because mom taught me to read when I was just a little baby. I've heard her tell the story a thousand times, how I'd be lying there in my crib and she'd flash these cards at me with words printed on them and pronounce the words, which she did for 20 minute periods, three times a day, practically from the day I was born. So I pretty much learned to talk and read at the same time. And I can't remember when I didn't know how to read. Mom says, my vocabulary is awesome. Dad's away from dawn to dusk every weekday in Santa Clara at a job of programming computers in a very demanding capacity. He earns an excellent salary, so we are a two-car family. We've got more cars than kids, they sometimes say laughingly, because mom comes from a family where they had six kids and only one car. Her family was Catholic which meant my grandma wasn't allowed to do family planning, so she just have to, kept on having babies uh, until they got into deep financial waters, and then she stopped. My father had a Jewish upbringing, so when he and mom fell in love, they decided to find a church halfway between Catholic and Jewish, and what they finally decided on was Protestant. So they're allowed to do family planning. Basically what that means is the wife takes a pill and her husband can screw her as much as he likes without putting babies in her stomach, which is why I'm an only child. Mom wants to have another baby someday, and Dad says they should be able to afford it a year or two down the line. But no matter how many kids they have, I'm not worried about sibling rivalry. <laughs> Jesus had a whole slew of brothers, too, and you never hear about what they did with their lives. There's just no comparison. Once a month, my dad goes to a men's group where they talk about what it's like to be a man nowadays since women started working. I'm not sure why he needs the group given the fact that my mother doesn't work. <laughs> but anyhow, all, uh, they all take turns sitting in a hot seat and telling the truth about their problems and then they're supposed to follow the group's advice. And if they disobey, they're punished with lots of push-ups. And sometimes the whole group goes out and does manly things like 
hiking and swearing and sleeping out in the wild and enduring mosquito bites because men ho have more stamina than women. I'm sure glad I was born a boy because it's far more unusual for boys to be raped than girls, except for if they're Catholic, which we're not. On the sobbing web, which I stumbled on one day when I asked Google for images of the war in Iraq, you can see hundreds of girls and women being brutally raped for free. And it says they were really and truly harmed in front of the camera. They sure don't look as if they're enjoying themselves, especially when they're gagged and tied up. Sometimes the men are not only screwing them in the mouth or their vagina or their anus, but also making as if to cut their nipples off with craft knives, although you don't see the nipples actually getting cut off, so it might just be make-believe. Mohammed Atta and the other 9-11 terrorists used, also used craft knives when they flew the planes into the Twin Towers when I was three years old. I can still remember Dad calling me in to watch the towers falling down over and over again and saying, fucking Arabs, and drinking beer. Well, thank you for choosing these paragraphs for your reading, because, I mean, they are really... They, they bring us to the core of the book. Or I, I have two or three questions or observations we can start with, perhaps. Because, I mean, these paragraphs which you, you've just read, they, they describe an extreme narcissism, extreme indivi oversized individuality, ego of a small boy. I mean, reading it, one has the impression it's a little monster, and one wonders how it will continue. And then, and what, what I found very powerful is the contrast in the first part, because your book has four, par, four parts. This is the first part about Solomon, the boy. And then you, we, the, the reader finds out that this ego is like not disappearing, but giving way to something else. And that something else is the history. It's a tradition. So... At the start, we have just this boy who is everywhere. He sees himself everywhere. And then we discover the people around him. And at the, 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 the last pages of the first part are no longer about the boy. They, the boy turns, the boy who was so much obsessed about himself turns into almost a neutral observer of something which goes beyond him. And that which goes beyond him is the history of his family, because that's a meeting of his great-grandmother with her stepsister in Germany. So for me, this contrast between narcissism, this extreme individualism, which is cultivated by his mother, and the reminder of the history of the community, which eventually almost erases this individualism, it's, it's a very powerful contrast. Mm. And there, there is a rupture in this first part, and that's about the birthmark. Birthmark is very important, because all of these characters have it. It's like a trademark of the family, of the tradition. And the mother of the boy, at a certain moment, decides to remove it. And this medical operation turns wrong. It's not fatal, but still, it's extremely complicated. And I just wonder whether you wanted to... Yes, you wanted to express by this like a punishment for this idea that our narcissistic individuality can control everything. And by erasing, erasing this or removing this birthmark, it's like cutting off from history, forgotten about who you are because it's just you and the world outside doesn't matter. So I just wondered whether you played with that when, when, when you sort of punished this poor small boy because... What, what I saw at the beginning as, as a really little monster, and then I regretted him a bit because uh, he suffered, he really suffered. Mm -hmm. uh, I should say, first of all, that the choice of these particular pages to read was made by Michael March and not by myself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but I was delighted to read them. I haven't, uh, I haven't hung out with 
little Solomon for a, a few years now. The, the book dates back to 13 years ago already, but um, I have it very present in my heart. I still uh, care a lot about these characters. Um, in some translations, the title of the book, instead of being Fault Lines, which is a geological metaphor, was Birthmarks. In Czech as well, in, in Italian as well, uh, and some other languages, because it was more appropriate. And it was a, a very good a possible choice of title for me too. Uh, let me just, for those of you, most of you probably have not read the book, so I just will say it takes place in the minds of four six-year-olds, and each successive chapter goes back in time one generation. So we start with Saul in 2005, whom you just heard his voice, and then we're going to be with his father at age six in 1982, at the time of the war between Israel and Lebanon, and then we're going to be with his grandmother Sadie when she is six years old and she's living in Toronto, and we're at the time of the Cold War in the early 60s, and then we're going to go back another generation to his great-grandmother's uh, era, whose real name is Christina, and she is six years old in Germany during the war, during the Second World War. And um, indeed, each of the kids has a birthmark, and for me, these, the meaning of this uh, birthmark, well, it's the sort of a symbol of a symbol. Um, in other words, humans are addicted, literally addicted to meaning. We cannot help finding meaning even when there is no meaning <laughs> and seeing symbols in everything. So obviously, if you, have, if you are born with a birthmark, it doesn't really mean anything. But each of these children will have a different interpretation uh, of his or her birthmark. So the, the little girl, Christina, growing up in Germany, she has a birthmark here at the crook of her elbow. And to her, it's something that symbolizes her, her singing voice, her, her favorite being of joy inside her. And so when she sings, she always rubs the inside of her arm and it helps her to sing beautifully. Her son, her, her daughter Sadie, um, hates herself. She's growing up in Toronto. She has a birthmark on her. They're always on the left side of the body. Hers is on the left buttock. And for her, it's a sign of dirtiness. And it explains the fact that her father left when she was born. And she doesn't know her father. She thinks he left because he was disgusted with her when he saw that birthmark. And so she hates it and she hides it and she doesn't want anyone to know about it. And then her son Randall, who is Saul's father, has the birthmark here at the base of his neck. And for him, it becomes uh, like a little animal, a bat that whispers into his ear, like a little conscience, maybe a little secret friend that gives him advice and talks to him and comforts him when he's scared. And then, so he's going to have this kid, Saul, who has the birthmark here on his temple. And indeed, his mother is going to make the decision to have it excised because she, as you can already guess, Tess, Saul's mother, is a complete completely obsessed with safety and health and everything has to be perfect. So she is afraid that that will turn into a melanoma, a cancer. So she wants to take it off when he's still a little boy before he starts school so the kids won't be teasing him about it. And indeed the operation goes badly. And the nice thing about these birthmarks in the book is that the readers also tend to all have their internal own interpretations of them and and so that was one of the ones that came up very often was to say America cuts out the memory they, they forget the past and they don't want to they want to in, 
pretend that they invented themselves. So they cut out the memory of the past and that can actually leave a bad wound that can get infected and then it brings it, the memory back in an even worse way. Yeah. So I never say yes or no, it means this or that. It's, uh, the meanings are, are what we also bring into the book. Yeah. But you seem to like uh, the marks because one of your previous books it's called the mark of the the mark of the angel in the English in the English translation, and that's a different kind of mark because that's a metaphysical mark. It's not visible. It is visible. The mark of the angel, excuse me, is this little mark under the nose, and according to Jewish belief, according to Jewish uh, dogma, it is the mark left by the angel because the baby in the mother's womb knows everything about human life and human history and then just before the baby is born an angel comes and goes Shh, puts his finger on the baby's lips Shh, and erases all of that memory and so that leaves this little imprint under the nose and that's this that's the mark of the angel but for you, do you see any link between this mark of the angel and the birthmark of your characters in the, in the fourth line? Um, only in the sense that it, uh, it's about tradition, about where we come from, about the fictions uh, that people give each other. So the birthmark is something that uh, it's, uh, it's more varied than, than the, yeah, it's not part of a sacred text. But really, Fault Lines was a very, very important book for me because um, it helped me to think about the construction of identity. And it was, for me, writing is always a sort of workshop of trying to understand a little more, go a little more deeply into what human beings are about, what human identity is about, and so on. And so, I wanted to write about children. I knew that I was interested in the Israel-Palestine situation. I traveled to Israel and Palestine to do the research for the book. I myself have very strong connections to Germany. I was raised by a German woman, my, my stepmother, who uh, was a little girl during the war. So I have a, probably a vision of, of Germany that uh, a lot of people from the outside don't have. Um, and so um, I wanted, it was uh, a really exciting, a very, very scary book to write because I was always feeling about this high and feeling as though adults were behaving in very, very frightening, unpredictable ways. And I, and I went through a year and a half of feeling scared of everything <laughs> because I really go very deeply into my characters. And on the other hand, it, it helped me to understand how we manufacture uh, people that are willing to kill or die for who they think they are. Because in each of these chapters, the kids change identities, actually. They change. Saul, as you pointed out, is, is led to move to another country. He goes to Germany with his great-grandmother. He gets to Germany, he finds that he can't understand what people are saying. And, you know, he, said, he thinks he's God. He thinks he's the Messiah. And, <laughs> and how dare they speak a language I don't understand? He says, you know, when I grow up, I'm going to make a law forbidding everybody to talk anything but English because it just it's not okay, you know, it's not okay. <laughs> He's going to... Little Randall is going to move from New York to Haifa. Little Sadie is going to have to move from Toronto to New York. And little Christina is going to have to move from Germany to Toronto. And so they're going to also sometimes change languages, change religions. One of the real uh, sources of this book for me, I don't know if we talked about it when we met earlier, was Gita Sereni. She was a wonderful, wonderful Hungarian writer and journalist, Hungarian-born who lived in London. She died a few years ago at 90-something. Marvelous, marvelous writer. And she wrote a book called The German Trauma. Uh, and in this book, she talks about her experience uh, working with UNRWA, the United Nations Ref Re Refugee um, Association, uh, immediately after the war. And I learned in that book about the stolen children 
and that there were something like 200,000 kids that the, that the Germans stole from other countries, including Poland, the Baltic countries, because they were losing so many young men. They needed to keep uh, Aryan-looking children coming up for the next uh, ranks of soldiers and women to make babies. So they, they had this incredible program of actually stealing other people's children and putting, placing them either in centers where they would be trained, raised to speak German, to salute, the, to salute to Hitler and to go through the Nazi uh, propaganda, or if they were very small, they were put into German families. And so that actually is the case of Christina. She actually comes from, a, from another family, but she was a tiny baby when she was stolen. And um, that was, uh, it was absolutely fascinating for me to work with uh, all of these different situations and to think that in the space of only half a century, within a single family, you could move from one religion, one language, one conviction to another and be on various sides of, of the wars, of the politics and so on. It's really about uh, the stories we tell ourselves in order to feel that we are somebody. Nancy, can I ask you about music? Because you like music. You play several instruments. Your first novel, or one of the first novel, was Goldberg Variations. And I see actually a lot of music in, in, in this book. Um, there is, of course, the singing of the great-grandmother. But uh, for me, in a more important way, it seems to me that the whole novel is like a symph symphony. Because you have four characters, which is four chapters, like four movements. And also, within the chapters, you have the contrasts and the themes which repeat themselves. So, is it just my reader's projection, or is it something which you are thinking about, writing a novel like a symphony, like you already did, or like Milan Kundera is doing? Kundera is a, a good, a right close example, although he's not by any means one of my favorite writers. We're both uh, addicted to musical forms, that's for sure, for sure, for sure. It's, uh, you use whatever helps, basically, and music helps, music helps. Um, I think um, my aunt was a professional pianist, especially a good piano teacher and she did some professional piano work and my mother was a, a very good, they were sort of two child prodigies when they were little and I think that when my mother left, because I grew up without my mother, I sort of stayed with the piano forever as a way of staying in touch with her in, in you know, symbolically in my mind and um, that's one thing but also probably because um, when you're trying to behave well because of what you're told to do at church, at school, in the family, and so on and so on. Um, I think that the emotions of the music I was allowed to play were very... It was one way of expressing my own emotions that I couldn't do in my everyday life. And so if I could really learn how to do this Beethoven and have the right to go <laughs> and it was such a relief to be able to express anger like that. You can see that I'm expressing lots of different emotions through, through my character. So in that sense, um, when, I, when I invent a character, it's almost like when I familiarize myself with the work of a new composer, like I'm, I really am trying to be at his or her service and trying to tell the truth and, and let them use my body and my mind to express themselves and that enables me to express lots of emotion. But I wish I played um, jazz, you know, I wish I, I have lots of friends who are jazz musicians. I do a lot of stage work uh, with jazz musicians, but I don't myself, unfortunately, have that gift of improvisation. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, w w when you are so much actually in music, you say you are not a genius in music, but you play very well, I guess. <laughs> we talk about beauty in music and beauty in literature. Do you think that it's actually justified to use the same word? Or is the experience of beauty in music and the experience of beauty when reading the text or actually writing the text, are these two experiences comparable or are they completely different? 
different? I think especially the, well, literature is a vague word because uh, if you include the poetry of Patrizia Cavalli, I, I really regretted not being able to meet her today, but I uh, did appreciate what I heard of, of the poetry you both read. And uh, poetry is something between novel and music. Uh -huh. It has the, um, the instantaneous presence of music and the, the joy in the sound. I use sound a lot when I write. I, I'm very careful about phonetics. I try to, you know, to work with the rhythms of the sentences and so on. But um, novels are about time passing. Novels are about mortality. Novels are, are about uh, human destiny, the, the tragedy of human destiny, really. And poems are much closer to the divine. Mm. Novel, novels are really the human genre, and, and poets are, poems are closer to something that is... Um, transcendent? Yeah, transcendent, because it's, it's in the instant. It's, uh, it's now. It's, it's always now. I think that was what Sim Simone Weil was aiming for mm. in everything she did and in her definition of beauty. My own definition of beauty is much dirtier than that, much shabbier than that, much... Um, yeah, and I, I don't like things to be too perfect, so that's why I, I'm a novelist. I mean, if I, if I knew how to be perfect, I would, but I, can't, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you say that your character, Christina, or Clarissa as well, she has several names, that she was somehow saved by beauty, by the fact that she was so much in the singing and that the singing helped her actually to overcome the circumstances which were really very, very bad. And then when she discovered her true origin, that she started to sing without words. So was it this quest for beauty perhaps which helped her somehow? Would you say so? Or? Uh, it's not something I can say yes to. Mm. Um, the amazing thing for me in Fault Lines is how many people we contain, because I identified completely with those four children who are very different from one another. And so that means, and it's a, it's a good thing for me to realize this, that I contain somebody, and you do too, because, I mean, everyone of us does, because we can read these books. It's a great privilege to be able to identify with so many different kinds of people and really understand them from the inside. And so I was overjoyed to know that I contained a little Christina, who is uh, sunlight. She's pure sunlight. She uh, she's, takes delight in things. She, she wants to love people. She wants to... And the, and the singing wells up from a sort of joy inside her. And at first she sings in German because her beloved grandfather is teaching her these wonderful hymns. And she sings to God in the church and so on. And, she's, and then she finds out that she isn't German, you know. And the, the young boy who tells her that is a Polish boy. He tells her that she's Polish. He's also a stolen child. He tells her she's Polish. So she starts learning Polish. And... She starts thinking, maybe I should sing in Polish. Then, at the end of the war, she's going to find out that she was Ukrainian originally. And she's going to go live with a Ukrainian family in Toronto. And so she doesn't know what language to sing in anymore. Her, the boy, the brother that she loves so much, tells her that Germans are horrible and she shouldn't sing in German. And that this grandfather is not her grandfather and she should not be singing what they had taught her to sing. And she loves this brother so much that she wants to be on his side. And so she makes the decision, as you say, to sing without words. And th that is based on the friend of mine, Tamia Valmont, to whom the book is dedicated and who has always sung without words and, she's, and she taught herself to sing using the, the jazz lines of uh, John Coltrane and things like that, just trying to imitate saxophone jazz with her voice and it's an, so I really had that in my ears when I was working. But I also contained uh, little Sadie who was uh, very, very 
depressed and angry because her mother is always absent. She's always making these singing tours all over the place and she hates her body. I know what that is too. And then I know about Randall, who is a very insecure little, little boy. And then I know about Saul, who is a megalomaniac. And a lot of people, when they, heard these, when they read these first pages of the book that I read to you tonight, they, they were sort of turned off by Saul and they said, what a little prick, you know. <laughs> Like I feel, you feel like slapping his face, and and I I was always surprised when people said that because it seemed to me if you, especially a child, I mean if you see a child that's behaving that way, you know that it's because it's the opposite. You know if he's saying, my parents love each other and they've got these photos of their wedding, you know those parents don't get along. You know those parents don't get along. He wouldn't have to say so 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 forcefully if they did, you know. And so almost everything you, almost everything he says, you have to take with a grain of salt. And as you say, by the end of the chapter, you're, you're behaving, you're, his armor is just cracking all over the place. It's falling to pieces. He doesn't, he doesn't know who he is anymore. Let's use this opportunity to open up for the discussion, for the debate with the audience. So please raise your hands. Whoever would like to pose a question or have a comment. Yes, Maria Ilyashenko, I think. <laughs> I think there is microphone coming. Um, I have a question because uh, you, sp you spoke uh, about your uh, heroes from your books who had to change identity by uh, moving to another country. Uh, and you told uh, that uh, you are Canadian, but you are living in Paris. Uh, so my question is uh, whether... Uh, you have the same experience or uh, your experience is completely different because probably you moved when you were adult and it was your decision. I just didn't catch the last part. But it was your decision to move. Ah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Well, uh, the fact is that I was moved around a lot. I was moved around a great deal when I was a little girl. Um, before I made the conscious decision to settle down in Paris. Um, my, my parents moved 18 times in nine years of marriage. Uh, and not just within one city, but from Calgary to Edmonton to Texas to Toronto and back to Calgary, Edmonton. So, so um, I think there was a huge amount of insecurity from that. And I, when I made the decision to settle in Paris, it was really... I'm going to stay, you know, but it's not because I, th I think that France is uh, a better country than some other countries, but I wanted to make the decision myself, and I definitely felt freed for a long time by living in a foreign language, writing in a foreign language, behaving in a foreign language, sort of wearing the, the mask of a, f of a Paris person or a French person for a while. And then that stopped working after a while, and I've, I've been through many stages of exile. But definitely it's something that, that interests me and that's important to me. Let me just read you one sentence I love by Jula Barnes. She says, Too great a sense of identity makes a man feel he can do no wrong, and too little does the same. C'est génial. <laughs> <laughs> too great a sense of identity makes a man feel he can do no wrong, and too little does the same. So I think if you take the too great a sense of identity, you, you might have Saul at the beginning of the chapter, we might have the current president of the United States. You know, they've just got too great a sense of identity, and he thinks he can do no wrong. But too little does the same. In other words, too little it would be somebody like... Uh, like Sioran, uh, with people who have too many different identities and they feel like everything is relative, nothing really counts. They, I've seen it all, I've done it all, I'm, you know. And then you can also f leave sort of morality mm. it, in the, from the back door in that sense. So for me, it's been important to not pretend that I'm French, you know. I'm Canadian. I was in Canada for f the first 15 years of my life, basically. 
my childhood, my entire adolescence from 15 to 20 in the United States, which is a huge part of my identity to all my families on the east coast of the state, so I go back constantly, and then 46 years in France. But there are so many things I don't like about France, you know, and uh, so I can't say, I see it from the inside, but I see it from the outside. I'm now in love with a Swiss guy, so I keep going back and forth across the mountains. And, but I still would never say, I, what I can't stand is when people say, uh, I'm a world citizen. Mm. I don't believe that at all. When I travel in Africa, which I do often, I know that I'm not from Africa. When I travel in China, I know that I'm not from China. Okay, so I, I'm, I can handle and write about the codes of cultures to which I'm close, which are France, English Canada, French Canada, the East Coast of the United States, the West Coast of the United States, <laughs> maybe a little bit of Germany. But I can't say I'm a nomad, I, I'm, I'm a human being. Those are meaningless sentences. We are culture material, you know? We are shaped by what we've been taught, what we've been told, and uh, we can't sort of just break out of the mold and say, I'm a generic human being. That doesn't exist. We wouldn't know what language to say it in. We wouldn't have a language to say it. Yeah. I mean, the motto of this year's festivals come from Simone Weil, and Simone Weil uh, has also developed this idea of having roots, enracinement. So that's probably something which you may feel close to, with the idea that there are still some roots that, mm -hmm. that they cannot be per perhaps overstated, that's too much of it, but mm -hmm. one cannot say we are without it. Yeah? Because, I mean, in your book yeah. it's also about the roots, and in the Mark of the Angel it's also very much about the roots of the main characters. So they are, they are there in your books. Yes. Actually, the sentence is not from Simon Weil originally. I uh -huh. think, as far as I know, it's from Dostoevsky. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay, that's idiots. like this. Yeah. Yes. But, um, no, I don't feel close to Simon Weil uh -huh. at all. Okay. Um, for many reasons. We'll probably go into it during the, the discussion tomorrow evening. Um, but it's interesting that she's, she, I, I think she's a brilliant, brilliant philosopher. But um, the two identities that she had at birth are among the things she never talks about, which are as a woman and as a Jew. Mm. She really saw herself as a Christian. She really basically became a Christian. And uh, though the Jews were being persecuted while she was writing and thinking, she doesn't actually talk about that. Um, she talks about uh, Jesus and she talks about, uh, uh, she has a sort of aspiration to motionlessness. Um, and if I may be so bold as to say so, my deepest conviction about Simone Weil is that she uh, was a victim of sexual abuse at a very early age. And since I happen to know her niece personally, that was confirmed by by her niece, and to me she shows all the symptoms of someone who was sexually traumatized and wanted life to stop, did not want to ever be touched again. So for her beauty is motionlessness. She likes literature that is motionless, she likes music that is motionless, you know, it's the, the Gregorian chant is mm. the ideal of music for her. And beauty is something that which should not be touched for her, something that is pure and sacred and untouchable. And th it's very interesting how she identified with the suffering of everyone except people like her. She w identified with workers, she identified with, uh, you know, all sorts of sufferings, the soldiers in, the, in war, uh, she starved herself to death. You know, she was an anorectic. She really starved herself, literally starved herself to death to become an object, to turn her body into a total motionless object was her goal. And, and
And she didn't write about uh, the oppression of women, whereas she was a woman. She didn't write about the oppression of Jews, whereas she was a Jew. So her enracinement, her rootedness, for me, is something uh, quite mysterious and contradictory. Okay. I have to ask, because you mentioned, or we referred to, to thinkers, writers, to whom you don't feel particularly close to, like Kundera and Well, who are the writers or thinkers you feel related to? Mm -hmm. My, um, I have several heroes and heroines. Um, among the, the heroes, don't, uh, I mentioned, I think, Romain Gary. Uh, Romain Gary is one of my absolute heroes. Um, in fact, I'm going to be going to Vilnius in November. And I, I try not to travel too much, but I really couldn't resist an invitation to Vilnius because Romain Gary was born there. And he was somebody who finally shot himself in the mouth, in the head, because he had too many identities. And because he spoke too many, he, he knew too much about the fact that we are nobody. You're not supposed to know that. You sort of have to agree to be somebody. And he didn't... Uh, he, he couldn't, he was, he was too many everybodies. He had about 17 different pseudonyms, and he was a very desperate, but a very, very wonderful, brilliant man. And I think I admire him pretty much more than almost anyone. Another one of my heroes, probably you may not know about, is John Berger, who was a British writer who lived in the French Alps. Uh, he died a couple of years ago was a, an amazing novelist and artist and theoretician of art. Very, very um, beautiful, beautiful man. My, among the poetesses I love, uh, Marina Tsvetaeva, of course. Mm -hmm. Toni Morrison, mm -hmm. one of my heroines. Alice, Alice Walker also. We always forget Alice Walker because Toni Morrison won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> but Alice Walker did not just write the color purple. She wrote many fantastic novels and they have not been translated enough. And sometimes I think, you know, um, does beauty save the world? I don't know because I think if it could, the world would be saved already. There has been so much beauty. There has been so much beauty. There has been Victor Hugo, there has been Toni Morrison, there has been this wonderful Akhmatova, these incredible poets and, and writers and composers and painters and look at this beauty and the world is far from saved and I'm not that optimistic about our chances of saving it but um, I sometimes think rather than continuing to write novels of my own, it would be just as useful for me to translate novels by Alice Walker, maybe I'll just devote the rest of my life to that. Thank you. Do we have we have we have time for one or two questions from the audience? If there is, I can't see much because there is a dark. Ah, there is there is a hand. Please stand up so that we can see you for the mic. mic. Please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Luke. Um, I just have a question um, that I've written down actually when you were speaking, just so I get it right. Um, this is for Nancy. Uh, as a writer and woman living in Paris, uh, do you feel that the depiction and treatment of beauty by mostly middle-aged white men, uh, bearing in mind the female characters of writers such as Michel Houellebecq, uh, comments this year of Jan Moi, for example, uh, but do you think this um, treatment of beauty will continue to influence or skew our idea of beauty, uh, whether in literature or wider culture? I'm sorry, I have a very hard time understanding. So the way uh, people like Welbeck and others depict beauty, treat beauty, whether you think that this, is, this will stay uh, the standard uh, in the literature. Is it correct or what I... Yeah. 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 I don't read Welbeck. <laughs> I stopped reading him many years ago. Okay. So I can't answer. Do you think that that but sort of treatment or sort of writing can continue to influence beauty, um, given that you know the majority of, um, of fiction that's written and that's read tends to be um, by men. 
can Welbeck continue influencing? No, whether the fact that, the, that it is the man who writes and who defines the beauty, whether that's something which will persist. Men. 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 Is, is it about men, yeah? Because it's difficult to hear somehow, so... Uh, I was speaking specifically about You writers. talked about a masculine approach to, to beauty. Yeah, a particular kind of... Um, or specific masculine yeah. approach like Welbeck and his kind, yeah? Yes. Okay, that's it. Yeah, I think they have an enormous influence. Um, and um, not only among young men, but uh, but young women as well. And but then there are other there are women in that same kind of uh, approach, like Virginie Despentes, uh, who's very ah, well, yeah. very important. Actually, I I read Virginie Despentes. I I really have decided not to read Welbeck anymore because uh, it just uh, makes me too angry, and I did, I don't find my anger is very useful. Um, so, I, a number of years ago, I wrote a book called Professors of Despair, and uh, there were, it was about why nihilism is fashionable in today's world, whereas including people who think, them, think of themselves as being on the left or progressive uh, and wanting to change the world in positive ways and so on, but as literary and theatrical tastes, they prefer people who have the message that life is shit and that uh, all forms of love are illusory and that um, basically life is totally meaningless. And there are many different professors of despair and types of professors of despair that I talk about. And some of them I really love, like Beckett is, is really a professor of despair whom I adore. And some of them I really, I just, um, they don't interest me. I mean, I think I've, I've sort of, four or five books is enough for me to figure out I don't need any more. But um, the interesting thing is that professors of despair, if they're not, if, yeah, if they're men, <laughs> almost always they had a very strong ideology in their childhood and then realized that it was wrong. So one of them was Kundera, uh, so either the ideology was Christian or it was religious. Uh, some of them were Orthodox Christians, some of them were Catholic, some Beckett was Protestant. And then they lose, and Kundera was communist, of course, which is a religion. And, uh, and then when you stop believing in that, you, actually everything collapses and you say you don't believe in anything and anything that people are, are, value you say it's a, it's just an illusion and so on and you have to always they will devalue women flesh babies reproduction love and so on and if the professor of despair is a woman she will devalue herself and so she will be Elfrida Jelinek is an example for in a case in point of being uh, you know, turning the violence very much against her own body. Sarah Kane also commits suicide. Uh, so generally, the, the female nihilists, because nihilism is a thing, something that is against time passing, it's against uh, the idea of, uh, of people being involved in families and reproduction and family history and things like that. So they're going to be uh, wanting, some, wanting life to stop, a little bit like Simone Weil, wanting things to be motionless. And, uh, and women, since the, their body shows time passing in very, very specific ways, such as their periods and things like that, they also hate their own bodies. It's not that women hate men. Men hate women, and women hate women. Oh. When we're in night. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we had ample time. We fulfilled it in a very, in an excellent way, thanks to you. So a big, big applause for the talk you gave to us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Merci. 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 Merci.
Merci. Thank you, Nancy. So I'd like very much to thank Nancy Houston, Peter Drulak. Really wonderful reading and conversation. Conversation. Two things, just two things. One is coffee. We have coffee for you here. It's a coffee break. So coffee, a little bit of dessert. Please join us for that. And come back at 8 o'clock for the gala evening. It's going to be a wonderful conversation. The horror of the world hides behind its beauty with Peter Drulak as a moderator, with Michael Cunningham, with German Greer, and Francois Julien. So st stick around. See you later. <laughs>